are the nicest people in Africa? All Africans are the nicest people in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a diplomat. If a one small Norwich girl from Africa can make a small contribution to the world, imagine the power that we all have. Do you believe that could actually happen over the next five years, maybe over the next 10 years? Let's do it. Hey there, welcome back to the show. I'm Carlos Watson. Today you're gonna love this show. Gonna introduce you to a truly extraordinary woman, truly extraordinary life story. Elizabeth Naya Moyaro is an award-winning humanitarian, author, and former UN Women's Senior Advisor. Incredibly humble beginning growing up in Zimbabwe, inspired a career of service and activism. Currently, she runs the He For She movement and was just named special advisor for the United Nations World Food Program. You can check out her incredible story in her memoir, I Am A Girl From Africa, or you can just keep watching. Here's my time with Elizabeth Nayamayaro. The Carlos Watson Show is brought to you by American Family Insurance. Hi, Elizabeth. Hey, Carlos, how are you? I am good, I'm good. Where are you today? I'm currently in Pasadena today. Are you a West Coast person? That's a tough question. If I could live in a warm place, it would be in Africa. Now it's time for me to quiz you about the continent. For $1,000, who are the nicest people in Africa? Ah, all Africans are the nicest people in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken <laughs> like a diplomat. I know a lot of people say that, but it's also quite true. And I also think Zimbabweans are really nice people. I mean, not because I'm from there, but I just think, you know, we're really peace-loving people that you can't get anywhere else. Where's the best food? Zimbabwe, ah. my, my home country, because I grew up with it. But if you love spicy food and like really creative dishes, then you have to be, you know, somewhere in the Central African Republic, DRC is amazing food. It is just so diverse. You know, you could be eating injera pancakes in Ethiopia, which is completely different to couscous in Morocco, which is completely different to sadza, which is like a maize meal, grits kind of thing for Americans. Where did you grow up within Zim? I grew up in a small village called Goromonzi, and I was raised there by my grandmother. I would say roughly 100 people live there in my sort of immediate community. And what's also interesting about that is that it was mostly my grandmother's relatives. It was just such a, you know, very tight knit community. And um, even just like simple things, like what it meant for us to be part of a community, our daily greeting, uh, we, we, we say to each other, Tiripo Kanamakadiwo, which is Shona language, which is my language. And what this literally translates to is, I am well as long as you are well, right? And it's this recognition that we are part of a community, that we are all connected. And if one of us is unwell, then none of us are unwell. And how did you come to be raised by your grandmother, if I may ask? My mom had me when she was very young and she couldn't take care of me. And she left me with my gogo -go when I was about one year old. And I actually didn't know up until the age of five that my gogo -go was not my mother because I thought she was my mother and she had raised me as, as if, you know, she called me her dear child. And so I assumed that she was my mother. And so she had left me with my gogo -go, who then raised me. And in retrospect, what a beautiful thing. Uh, it was obviously jarring at the age of five finding out that she wasn't my mother because I so wanted it to be my mother. How old were you when you met her? I met her when I was 10 years old. She arrived one day. Gogo and I were in our small round hut. By the way, this is my home. This is literally the hut in which I grew up. We were inside this hut. It was in the middle of another drought. It was so hot outside. And suddenly there was a voice outside and like we always do in our village i thought it was just another aunt from another village or even from our village and i was gleefully asking her to come in and she walks into this hut and she sits down and she has brought this lovely you know goodies from us from the city i then found out that she was my mother and she was coming to take me away from my village she literally dragged me out of the hut and i was crying and I was clinging on to Gogo. -go. And interestingly enough, it was also the beginning of God's greatest miracle for me. 
because that also came with an opportunity to go to school. So where does a young one go from there? Prior to me meeting it, a lot of things had happened. So a severe drought hit my village at the age of eight. And literally there was nothing to eat or drink. And I had my sort of really big moment, a life-threatening moment where I actually thought I was going to die. I collapsed on the ground. I hadn't eaten for a few days. And in this moment, just the most incredible miracle happened. This African girl who worked for the United Nations found me and she gave me a bottle of porridge that literally saved my life. And when I actually found out who she was, that was the moment that sparked my dream to become a humanitarian, by the way. And I remember thinking, I just want to be like her, right? Because I too want to save the lives of others in a similar way that my life had been saved. What kind of a student, what kind of teenager did you turn into? When you grow up without education and then you get it and you see what it's able to do for you. I was very, still very inquisitive, you know. I was curious about the world, not only the world around me, but because education had expanded my horizon, I became also interested about other parts of the world. In my teens, all I was determined to do was to try and make it out of Africa and go to the UK and try and work for the United Nations. Our home is the training ground for her dreams policy. Ensure carefully, dream fearlessly. How do you see Zimbabwe and where it is today and what its journey has been over the last 20 years? We have gone through a really big evolution. I was born during my country's revolution. Because of British colonial rule, one tactic that colonialism used as a means to control the majority African population was this deliberate separation of us into different groups and tribes, right? And they gave us different rights. And these rights were meant to pit us against each other so that while, whilst we were fighting amongst ourselves, they would continue to rule over all of us. So Zimbabwe, when I was growing up, we had this key moment. What were we going to do? We were finally free. We could do what we always wanted to do, to own our land, to be in charge. We embraced our Ubuntu, we came together. I remain optimistic that my country will bounce back. For people who don't pay close attention to African politics, but want to start paying attention for so many different reasons, who are three or four of, of the leaders on the continent today that you think are up and comers? 10 of the fastest growing economies are on the African continent. I think there are leaders that are getting this right. And in particular, even just looking at the current COVID pandemic, where most people in the West, they had literally dismissed Africa and said, it's going to be a disaster for the African continent. But we saw strong leadership emerge, even much more than we saw in countries, in the developed countries, including the US. I have to be the cheerleader of my continent and say, you know, there is so much great coming out of the African continent. I've just picked up one of my favorite snacks from my local bodega or convenience store. For many families in America, stores like these are their primary access to food. Unfortunately, these stores rarely sell fresh produce, leaving communities only able to access highly processed food that is full of preservatives and empty calories, leaving communities stranded in what is commonly known as food deserts. Elizabeth, how do you think about um, the question of hunger? I know you've been spending a lot of time about on that as a professional. Hunger is still the number one cause of death in the world. Every five seconds, a child dies from hunger. And yet, here's the reality. We actually, as a society, grow enough food to feed everyone. Right now, there's at least 700 million people who go to bed hungry every single night. And that number in the US, we also know the Biden administration just did a, a study. I think one in nine American families don't even know where their next meal is going to come from. And yet we are also at the same time wasting enough food. We're throwing away enough food to feed 2 billion people, which is like double the amount of people that are going hungry. In the US, roughly 40% of the food we produce never gets eaten. 
That's over £365 million pounds of food each day. So it is fundamentally an issue of inequality when we talk about hunger. Well, why do you think that is? It all comes down to power. Who is making the decision, right? Who has the power? How do they use the power to make decisions and in, in what way and for whose benefit? Our governments do not have the diversity that they need in order to make decisions that reflect the needs of the underserved communities. It's important to point out that before the pandemic, the world wasn't equal anyway. We live in a society right now where more than 730 million people globally live on less than $2 a day. When it comes to hunger, you know, the issue was still dire, but it's become even more because of the current COVID pandemic. In September this year, the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres is hosting for the very first time a food system summit in New York. We want everyone, citizens, youth, companies, governments to all come together with some quick solutions that we can all use. Do you believe that could actually happen over the next five years, maybe over the next 10 years? I think that's the decision that we all have to make as a collective. Nothing is going to change if we continue with business as usual. You know, I see the pandemic, which has been really, really devastating, but I also see this as an opportunity for what I'm calling the Great Reset. It's also partly the reason why I wrote my book. I'm excited to be at the Strand Bookstore this morning to sign copies of I'm a Girl from Africa. I realized at some point that I am only one individual, but I do have a powerful story. And that powerful story is if a once malnourished girl from Africa can make a small contribution to the world, imagine the power that we all have as a collective to actually create more societies that are equal and more just and more sustainable. Do you think enough people actually really care? Yes, there are some people who are never going to care about what happens to somebody else. But I've also found, you know, as I've gone around during the book tour speaking to people, that a lot of people just aren't aware. They aren't aware, you know, they've been born with a certain level of privilege. They live, again, in a bubble within their own community, and they aren't aware of the issues impacting uh, other people. In, in some cases, they don't even know that they can play a role in that. And so, Part of the work you know, for us as humanitarians is to actually try and raise that awareness. This pandemic, as devastating as it has, it has now shown people what we as Africans have always known, that we are connected by our shared humanity, that what impacts one part of the world can indeed impact all of us, that as long as I am unwell, then none of us are unwell. The weapon of rape, accusations against soldiers and rebels of women being targeted for violence in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Let me take you somewhere else in the continent, if I may. I've always been taken a little bit heartbroken in many ways by what's happened in the Congo. Mm. Have you spent time in the Congo and what have you learned about that at all? It is devastating. I mean, as a gender expert, you know, we've spent a lot of time trying to look for ways to solve the issue. When we look at countries like the Congo as well, we have to understand that in addition to what is happening on a day-to-day -day basis, there are major, major legacies of colonial policies that have constantly, and up until today, continuously tried to divide people. But the issue of race is really an issue of gender inequality, right? One of the big things that I, I implemented when I was at the United Nations, uh, the UN Women, when I was working on gender specifically, was launching this movement called the He For She movement, which invited men and boys to be part of the solution because I realized at some point that it was quite unfair that we put all the responsibility on women and girls not to get raped, rather than actually just engage the men who are raping the women to not rape the women. To my surprise, to my colleague's surprise, I think initially there was a bit of hesitation that, first of all, it was controversial because some traditional feminists said, why are you engaging men? They are the problem. Uh, and then there was also the other voices that said, men won't care about this thing. They just won't join. And to our surprise, we launched this He For She movement and literally within three days, at least one man in every single country in the world had joined He For She. I am a He For She. I am a He For She. I am a He For She. We are He For She. 
And within that one week, there was 1.2 billion, billion, not million, conversations for men around the world. Liz, what is the most interesting thing you've learned about dreaming fearlessly in this life? That a dream, when you dream big and you make it a dream for others, you have much more fulfillment in your life. Interesting. That I wonder, I wonder around the world if most people are able to dream not just for themselves, but for others. So that was actually another important uh, lesson, Carlos, for my grandmother. So this idea of Ubuntu, this shared humanity, there's also the way that you dream through the Ubuntu lens. And she explained to me, in fact, this is why I became a humanitarian, right? She said, when you dream through the Ubuntu lens, you have to dream a dream for others. You must dare to dream a dream for others. And that's such a powerful concept because my dream almost became a near impossible task. It was one of the most difficult things I've ever done. And I could have given up so many times, but I constantly reminded myself that this dream was bigger than just for myself. Because me becoming a humanitarian may also mean that I would be able to uplift the lives of my community, my country, my continent, and hopefully one day the world. So it's a really, really powerful idea. And I wish more people would do that. Elizabeth, do you mind if I do a little bit of rapid fire with you? Let's do it. Okay. Other than your own book, what's your favorite book of all time? Things Fall Apart, Shinoa Chebe. Elizabeth, what is your karaoke song? I Will Survive. I love that, Gloria Gaynor. If you could have dinner with anyone, dead or alive, who would you love to have dinner with? Nelson Mandela. Biggest mistake you feel like you've ever made in this life? Doubting God's intent. Most interesting thing you've learned about love? It's the most powerful feeling and emotion you can ever experience. What brings you peace? My family. When was the last time you were afraid? COVID pandemic, beginning of it. What two African countries should we keep an eye on? Ghana and Zimbabwe. Elizabeth, I'm going to leave it there, but thank you so much for, uh, for joining me. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Carlos. This was really lovely. And uh, I hope I can see you in person someday in the future when things open up. I would love that. I thought she was amazing. I actually went home and talked to my partner about it. I thought it was just a great story about her coming up. It was just... Very emotional. Yeah, but she brought a lot of sunshine. I think so too. She's yeah. bright and energetic. Mm -hmm. I think she's just very happy that she yeah. is in the place that she's at and can do the work that she's always wanted to do, right? Yeah. I thought it was beautiful. She was so warm. Her presence just came through the screen. I just loved that. Her journey is just so incredible. Story about her grandma. She was surrounded by love, you know, and then to get pulled into this place that she didn't know anyone. She didn't have any of that love that she was so used to, but she was able to get education. And so I just feel like this amazing lesson there about seeing the joy around you, but also understanding that a different circumstance could also be really good for you. I thoroughly enjoyed her and I actually knew nothing about her. I'm definitely going to read her book. The word responsibility really resonates right now, responsibility within society and how, especially people of color who are successful, have this great sense of responsibility for the people coming behind them. I'm so in awe of it. And I think that's what we all need to be doing. It's that paying it forward. And I'm so inspired by her and so many other people we've talked to lately. Hey, hope you enjoyed Elizabeth Nayamiaro. Uh, what a fantastic person. What an intriguing story. God bless her grandmother and so many other good people who've believed in her, who've loved her, who've helped elevate her. And I'm looking forward to what she continues to do for the rest of us and the rest of the world. All right, as always, thank you for watching the show. We'll see you again every weekday right here on The Carlos Watson Show. It's still the night shift, just brighter. Still a night out? but everything fits in. Chevrolet, making life's journey just better. 
we don't know what our kids are capable of because um, their education sometimes is so limiting. Particularly in black and brown classrooms, there's always an emphasis to me on body control. Um, you can go into a very affluent white classroom and the kids are moving around the room and talking and there's lots of activity and you assume that something magical is happening. You go into a black classroom and the kids are moving around and interacting with each other and it's perceived very differently, right? Immediately someone thinks that teacher doesn't have classroom management skills. But I think it's also kind of limiting what we allow our kids to have access to. And we want to invite students to tell us, what are you curious about? If you have a hook and a kid is really excited about a particular subject, or some sort of content, lean into the things that they do well so they build the confidence they need as students to tackle the things that are a little more challenging. Shockingly, 14 million students are in schools with police, but no counselor, nurse, psychologist, or social worker. And two out of every five students say they feel unsafe with police officers in school, which begs the question, who are they protecting? It would be a better country for all of us if Black children and white children got equal educations and had equal opportunities. So what has the last year done? Because there was, there were more conversations about race than I remember in my life during the Black Lives Matter protests. Has that changed in your experience? I think in some ways, obviously, it's better because of awareness, and especially with social media, you know, it has its flaws, but it's bringing things to, like, more attention to important issues. But for me, it kind of feels like it's worse because now I feel like any of my white friends or people at work, they're walking around eggshells around me because they're afraid that anything they're gonna say is offensive. Or when I say, hey, like this is actually a microaggression or this feels kind of ignorant. Like I'm trying to let you know, it's instantly, instead of, hey, I apologize that I did those things and here's how I'm going to change. Now it's like defending, I'm not racist, I'm not like this, I'm not like this and this and that. It, it almost seems like they feel like the finger is pointed at them and everybody's walking around eggshells and can't have that conversation because they're so afraid to be called out for something negative. Hey.